Hi everyone, this is the first video of chapter 10. And so I think instead of doing one video for an entire lecture, I'm gonna break it up into two or three smaller videos just to keep things simple and straightforward. So this is the first video for chapter 10. And so in chapter 10, we're gonna to start to talk about the economy in the short run and short run economic fluctuations. So primarily so far, we focus on what happens to the economy over longer periods of time, over a few years or a few decades or something like that. But instead, we're gonna to start to focus on how the economy behaves over the period of a couple of years or a couple of months and why the economy has these short run fluctuations. So a lot of times we call these short run fluctuations business cycles. And so in the US, uh, on average, our total GDP grows about three or three and a half percent a year in the long run. But we see a lot of variability of this in the short run. Sometimes GDP growth is really, really high. We're growing at 5% a year. Sometimes growth is really, really low. We're only growing at 1% a year. Sometimes our growth is even negative. We're in a recession. And this tends to come from changes in consumption and investment. So consumption and investment tend to be the, the less stable portions of GDP. If you remember from chapter three, GDP Y is equal to C plus I plus G plus NX. Primarily, primarily those fluctuations tend to come from investment and a little bit from consumption. And so when GDP starts to fluctuate, we usually see unemployment fluctuate as well. Unemployment tends to go up when the economy is not doing particularly well, and it tends to come back down when the economy is really, really strong. So this negative relationship between GDP and unemployment, we call that Oaken's Law. It tends to hold pretty much internationally. Anytime an economy is doing well, realistically, the unemployment rate is falling. Anytime an economy is doing poorly, chances are the unemployment rate is going up. And so if we look historically, we can see that uh, <clears throat> GDP tends to go up over time. So on average, we see that red line, we see about 3% of growth, but we really see a lot of short run fluctuations. So we saw growth that was really, really high. Right here in the mid 70s, we saw growth that was really, really high here in the late 80s. We've also seen times where the economy is really, really sluggish. Right here in the early 80s, we saw a really, really sluggish economy. Obviously in 2008, we saw that the economy was really, really sluggish. It moved really slowly and we actually saw negative growth for a period of time. But we can really see that the economy tends to fluctuate around that red line pretty significantly in the short run. And so if we superimpose uh, investment and consumption on that same graph, we can see that consumption tends to not fluctuate a ton when compared to GDP. So GDP is this blue line. We see that consumption is actually somewhat stable compared to everything else. Consumption is this gold line. And realistically, investment is what is so unstable. We see times when the economy is doing really, really well, that businesses are really excited about that. We see really, really high rates of investment. Everybody's really trying to take advantage of a really strong economy. When the economy is really struggling, we see investment start to crater. So here in the Great Recession, we saw investment actually decrease by about 30%. And that primarily comes from people just not being excited about where the economy is going. Investment tends to reflect attitudes about the overall economy. And so as a result, we see it's really, really unstable in the short run, largely causing these short run changes in total output. And so if we look at unemployment instead, we can see that unemployment also tends to follow that same kind of pattern where it fluctuates a lot in the short run. We can see that unemployment tends to go up during recessions, these shaded regions right here. And so in the 1980s, we had really, really high unemployment for a long time. We had two quick recessions in the early 1980s and unemployment continued to go up through those recessions. But as the economy got stronger in the late 1980s, unemployment started to fall fairly significantly. So in 1984, it was about 12%, 11%. But by 1990, unemployment had come all the way down to below 5%. We see the same thing here recently. During the Great Recession, unemployment peaked at about 11% again, really, really high unemployment. But we know that since then, unemployment has dropped really, really significantly. Uh, in February, of 2020, we were way back down to three and a half percent unemployment. Unemployment had, had gotten really, really low at the time because the economy was doing really well. 
And so if we look at the correlation between GDP growth and the change in unemployment, we see this really, really strong negative correlation. We see that Oaken's law holds really, really steadily throughout time. But when GDP is growing really, really quickly, we see that unemployment tends to be falling. So when we have GDP growth of eight or 10% a year, chances are unemployment's coming down by two or three percentage points. If the economy is shrinking, we're in a recession, and we see GDP growth of negative 3%, chances are the unemployment rate's increasing by about four percentage points a year. We see significant changes in both GDP growth and unemployment growth. So primarily, this, this distinguish, distinguishing feature that we see comes from uh, looking at everything in the short run. So primarily, so far, we've looked at the economy in the long run. We've assumed that prices are flexible, but that any change in supply and demand pretty quickly passes through. It's just a change in prices. But now we're going to relax that assumption a little bit. We're going to say that prices can be sticky in the short run, where businesses can't really respond to changes in supply and demand. And so they're kind of stuck with this short run price. And so when we impose this assumption that prices are sticky in the short run, we see very, very different results out of the model. And so just a quick recap, most of what we've done so far is called classical theory. It's just this theory that output is completely determined by the inputs of the model. The output is completely determined by capital, labor, and technology. And that these changes in the demand for goods and services only pass through as a change in prices. Now the primary assumption again here is that prices are completely flexible in the long run. That if we have a change in total demand, a business can respond by changing its price. And in the long run, over several years or several decades, this is probably a pretty good assumption. But when we start to look at the short run, we see that businesses somewhat struggle to change prices fairly quickly. They're either locked into some kind of a contract or they, ha they have to face menu costs in the short run. And so that requires us to develop a different theory for why business cycles occur over the short run. And so when prices are sticky, like we're gonna assume pretty much for the rest of the semester, we see that output and employment can depend on, depend on demand as well. And because it can depend on demand, fiscal policy can start to play a really important role for the determination of GDP. So government spending and taxation can be really, really important. Additionally, monetary policy can really, really matter in the short run. It doesn't just pass through as an immediate change in prices. And then we can have exogenous changes in consumption or investment. It can play a really significant role in these short run economic fluctuations. And so if you wanna just keep everything fairly simple, fairly straightforward, the first theory we primarily had was the economy in the long run over several years, where we assumed that prices were flexible, that Unemployment occurred, but we didn't really explain fluctuations in unemployment. Then we moved to growth, which is simply the economy in the very long run. We still assumed full uh, flexible prices. We assumed that you fully employed all of your labor, all of your capital, and that capital and labor could grow. So now for the rest of the semester, we're gonna focus on the economy in the short run. We're not really gonna worry about the growth of a population or the growth in capital, but we're gonna look at the changes in uh, how you implement your labor and your capital. We're gonna assume that prices are fairly sticky and that we can have short run fluctuations in unemployment. We're, my, we're mainly looking at changes over a month to a month or year to year, but these changes in the really, really short run. And so to do this, we're gonna build on that basic simple supply and demand model that you probably learned in 201 and 202. So, but obviously because this is macro, we're gonna call it aggregate supply and aggregate demand. And this is primarily our workhorse model for macroeconomics. It's the model that everything else is kind of built off of. So it's this paradigm model, for pretty much everything we do. It shows how the price level and output are determined in the short run specifically and in the long run. And so we can see primarily everything that we've covered so far, as well as these short run economic fluctuations. So in this video, we're just gonna cover aggregate demand. We'll cover aggregate supply further in the next video. But for aggregate demand, it's just gonna show this inverse relationship between the price level and the quantity of output demanded, just like in 201 and 202. And so we can actually derive this model 
straight from the quantity theory of money that we had in chapter five. And so for our aggregate demand curve, let me switch to the whiteboard. So for our aggregate demand curve, it's gonna look exactly like pretty much every demand curve you've seen to this point. We have a price level on the y-axis, an income or output on the x-axis. And we're just gonna say that aggregate demand is a downward sloping line. You're gonna to have to kind of bear with me as I get used to the new technology. But we're gonna say that this aggregate demand curve is just a reflection of this inverse relationship between price level and total output. So an increase in the price level Going to cause a fall in real money balances. So you're going to have to think back to our money demand equation from chapter four. And so our real money balances are really just M over P. And so when our real money balances fall, that's gonna cause a decrease in our total demand for goods and services. Basically with higher prices, our money doesn't go as far, so we can't buy as much stuff. That's all we're really saying here. So our aggregate demand curve is basically just this simple, straightforward explanation for why uh, the quantity theory can also hold in the short run as well. And so if we go back to the PowerPoint, we're gonna build on this theory a little more in chapters uh, 11 and 12. We're gonna really explore aggregate demand uh, in the short run. But it's going to show that this price level causes, again, this fall in real money balances. That when prices increase, the, the effective buying power of the money supply goes down. Basically, it takes more money to buy the same amount of goods, and that's going to decrease our total demand for goods and services. But an increase in the money supply can shift that entire curve to the right. Basically, if everybody suddenly has more money, at each given price level, they can buy more, right? That's going to look something like this. Okay, so we're going to clear off everything we've got so far. So we're going to draw pretty much the same aggregate demand curve. We're going to call it AD1. And so if the Fed suddenly increases the money supply, they lower interest rates and increase the money supply, that's going to shift this whole aggregate demand curve to the right to AD2, basically suddenly there's all this extra money in the economy. Because there's all this extra money in the economy, everybody now has a greater ability to spend. And so an increase in the money supply is gonna shift that entire aggregate demand curve to the right. It's not gonna change the slope or anything like that. It's just gonna shift the entire curve to the right. So in this, we can actually see how monetary policy can play a really important role in the short run. So as the Fed increases and decreases the total amount of money in the economy, as they change the money supply, it's going to change aggregate demand pretty, pretty immediately. So as they increase the amount of money, it's going to shift that AD curve to the right and increase everybody's potential buying power. If they wanted to cut back on aggregate demand, they could decrease the money supply, shift that aggregate demand curve back to the left, 
but we can see that in this model, monetary policy can play a really important role for aggregate demand in the short run. Okay.